Greetings. My name is Brian Johnson. Welcome to the Blue Belt Folk Tale Podcast. I'm here to introduce you to the world of Norwegian folklore, the world of Peter S. Bjornsson and his colleague, Jorgen Moe. Many authors, educators, scholars, and casual readers know of the tales recorded by the Brothers Grimm, Joseph Jacobs, the Arabian Nights Entertainment Volumes, and Hans Christian Andersen. I'm here to introduce you to a corner of folklore that is lesser known and not explored by the media as often as other bodies of folklore. A world of trolls and mountainsides, clever heroes, and great fjords. Now sit back and enjoy these Norwegian anthems. Welcome back to the Blue Belt Folktale Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the reading and to the preservation of Norwegian folklore. My name is Brian Johnson, and I'll be narrating these stories, as well as hosting the, the discussion that follows. In my first story, or my first episode, I should say, I pre-selected a story to kind of get the ball rolling and introduce you to a story directly this week, I'm going to start reading these stories in chronological order, or at least the, the order in which they appear in this book. Now, this next story is also an Ashlad story, or Boots, or Ash Paddle, depending on the translation. This story also involves a troll. This story also te- touches on how the youngest child is often mistreated by his brothers and often people above him. In the last story, the king loved his sons unconditionally, and in this story that is not the case. Our hero has to go through some trials before he is really recognized as an equal by his peers. The story also has some interesting and yet relevant commentary on how promotions and our and the elevation of our social status is raised today and sort of how our actions speak louder than words so that was my brief synopsis now i'm going to jump right into the story this is ashlad who stole the troll silver ducks coverlet and golden harp there once was a poor man who had three sons When he died, the two elder sons were about to set off into the world to try their luck, but they refused to take the youngest with them. You, they said, the only thing you're good for is sitting here and digging in the ashes. Then I suppose I'll have to go alone, said Ashlad. The two sons left. They came to a royal palace, and they found jobs as servants. The first was hired by the stable master, and the other by the gardener. Ashlad also set off. He took along a big bread trough, which was all they had left from their parents, though his brothers had no use for it. The trough was heavy to carry, but he didn't want to leave it behind. After he'd, been walked, after he'd walked for a while, he too arrived at the royal palace and asked to be hired as a servant. They told him they had no need for him, but he pleaded so sincerely and politely that finally he was allowed to go to the kitchen. There he could carry firewood and water for the kitchen maid. He was hardworking and clever, and it didn't take long before everyone grew quite fond of him. But his two brothers were lazy, and for that reason, they were beaten and received only meager wages. They grew jealous of Ashlad when they saw things were going much better for him. Right across from the royal palace, on the other side of the lake, lived a troll who had seven silver ducks that swam about in the water and could be seen from the palace. The king had often wished he might own those ducks, so the two brothers said to the stable master, Our brother has boasted that if he wanted to, he could get those seven silver ducks for the king. As you might expect, it wasn't long before the stable master told the king about this. The king then summoned Ashlad and said, Your brothers say that you can get me get the seven silver ducks for me, so that is what you must do. That's not something I've thought or said, replied the boy. But the king insisted. You did say it, and you shall do it, he said. 
All right, said the boy. Seeing as I have no choice, give me a quarter barrel of rye and a quarter barrel of wheat, and I will try. He was given the rye and wheat, which he put in the bread trough that he brought from home. Then he got in the trough and rode, ac rode across to the lake. When he reached the opposite side of the shore, he began walking along, scattering the grain here and there. Finally, he managed to lure the ducks into the trough, and then he began rowing back as fast as he could go. When he reached the middle of the lake, the troll appeared on shore and caught sight of him. Are you making off with the seven silver ducks that belong to me? Yes, I am, said the boy. Will you be back this way again, asked the troll. That may be, said the lad. When he brought to the king the seven silver ducks, everyone at the royal palace grew all the more fond of him, and even the king said it was a job well done. But his brothers grew more resentful and envious. They decided to tell the stable master that Ashlad had boasted that if he wanted to, he could bring to the king the troll's coverlet, which had a silver pane and a golden pane, and another silver pane and another golden pane. Once again, the stable master didn't hesitate to report this to the king. The king then told the boy what his brothers had said, that he had boasted he could get the troll's coverlet with the silver and golden panes. So that was what he had to do, or else he would lose his life. Ashlad replied that this was not something he had thought or said, but it did him no good. So he asked for three days in which to consider the matter. When the time was up, he again rode across the lake in the bread trough, and then walked back and forth on the shore, keeping an eye out. Finally, he saw that those who lived inside the mountain had come out to hang up the coverlet to air. When they were safely back inside the mountain, Ashlad grabbed the coverlet and began rowing back as fast as he could go. When he was in the middle of the lake, the troll appeared and caught sight of him. Are you the one who took my seven silver ducks? shouted the troll. Yes, I am, said the boy. And are you now making off with my coverlet, with one silver pane, and one golden pane, and another silver pane, and a golden pane? Yes, I am, said the boy. Will you be back this way again, asked the troll. That may be, said the boy. When he got back with the golden and silver coverlet, everybody grew even more fond of him than before, and he then became the king's personal servant. That made his two brothers even more resentful. To seek revenge, they said to the stable master, Our brother has now boasted that he can get for the king the golden harp the troll owns. It's a harp that will make everybody happy when they hear it, no matter how sad they might be. The stable master reported that this at once to the king, who said to the boy, since you said that, you must do it. If you succeed, you shall have the princess and half my kingdom. But if you don't succeed, you shall lose your life. That is not something I have either thought or said, replied the boy. But I suppose there is nothing to be done about it. And I will have to try. But I will need six days to consider the matter. He was granted the six days, but when they were up, he had to set off. He put in his pocket a nail, a birch twig, and a candle stump, and rode across the lake. Then he crept about, walking back and forth. After a while, a troll came out and caught sight of him. Are you the one who took my seven silver ducks? shouted the troll. Yes, I am, replied the boy. Are you also the one who took my coverlet with the silver and golden panes? asked the troll. Yes, I am, said the boy. Then the troll grabbed him and took him inside the mountain. So, daughter of mine, he said, I've got him now, the one who took my silver ducks, and my coverlet with the silver and golden panes. Put him in the sty to fatten him up. When we slaughter him, we'll invite all our friends. She gladly did so at once. She put Ashlad in the sty, where he stayed for eight days, and was given the very best food and drink he could ever wish for, and as much as he wanted. When the eight days were up, the troll told his daughter to go out and cut into the boy's little finger and see if he was fattened up. So she went over to the sty. Give me your, your little finger, she said. Instead, Ashlight stuck out the nail, 
which he tried to cut. Oh no, he's still hard as iron, said the troll's daughter when she went back to her father. We can't take him yet. After another eight days, the same thing happened. Only this time, Ashlad held out the birch twig. He's a little better, she said when she went back to the troll, but he'll be tough as wood to chew. After eight days, the troll again told his daughter to go and see if he was fattened up. Give me your little finger, said the troll's daughter when she got back to the sty. This time, Ashlad held up the candle stump. Now he's ready, she said. All right then, said the troll. I'll be off to invite our guest. In the meantime, you must slaughter him. Then fry half of him and boil the other half. After this, the troll left. His daughter set about sharpening a big, long knife. Is that what you're going to use to slaughter me? asked the boy. That's right, said the troll's daughter. It's not sharp enough, said the boy. Why don't you let me sharpen it? Then it will be easier for you to take my life. So she let him have the knife, which began, which he began honing and sharpening. Let me try it on your braid, said the boy. I think it's ready now. She agreed to let him do that, but the instant he grabbed hold of the troll's daughter's braid, he yanked her head back and cut it right off. Then he boiled half of her and fried the other half and set the food on the table. After that, he put on her clothes and sat down in the corner. When the troll came home with the folks he'd invited, he asked his daughter, for he thought it was her, to come and eat dinner with them. No, replied the boy, I don't want any food. I feel very grumpy and sad. Well, you know what to do about that, said the troll. Get the golden harp and play it. Yes, but where exactly is it, said the boy. You know very well where it is. You were the one who played it last. It's hanging over there above the door. The boy didn't have to ask twice. He took down the harp and played it as he walked in and out of the house. All of a sudden, he pushed the bread trough out into the water and began rowing so fast that the water surged around the trough. After a while, the troll thought his daughter had been gone a long time, and he went outside to see what had become of her. Then he saw the boy in the trough far, far away on the lake. Are you the one who took my seven silver ducks, shouted the troll? Yes, said the boy. Are you the one who took my coverlet, the silver panes, and the golden panes? Was that you too? Yes, said the boy. And have you now taken my golden harp? Yes, that I have, said the boy. But didn't I just eat you? No, it was your daughter you ate, replied the boy. When the troll heard that, he grew so angry that he burst. Then Ashlad rode back to shore and gathered up a big heap of gold and silver, as much as he thought he could carry. When he got back to the, to the royal palace with the golden harp, he was given the king's daughter and half the kingdom, just as the king had promised. But he treated his brothers well, for he thought that everything they'd done was only because they wanted the best for him. So that was Ashlad, who stole the trolls, silver ducks, coverlet, and golden harp. The story is honestly very, very generic and kind of a standard template for these Ashlad stories. But after reading more carefully for the third or fourth time, I noticed some discrepancies. First, I'll talk over the setup. Not necessarily the ATU type, which maybe a bit more complex, but the standard setup of these boots or ash lad or ash panel stories. You've got three brothers who are born to poverty. You've got the death or the misfortune of their father or their parents. Either or. Then usually you have some quest that has been commissioned by the king. And all the brothers are to try their luck. And often it's the case that the two eldest brothers look down on their youngest sibling, who is secretly the most talented 
and brave out of all of them. And the story ends with the youngest completing all the king's usually three challenges, and he then himself becomes a king after he's married the king's daughter and inherited his fortune. In the story, all of that happens, but not necessarily in the standard way. In the story, the initial quest is just simply survival. And in a way, they all sort of succeed. They all get employment. And the real quest, which is more typical of these stories, isn't brought about by the king. It's actually established by the brothers. The king merely orders him to do so. And often that isn't the case with these stories. Another detail left out is that often the brothers are required or want to embark on the quest as well. And in this and in this story, the brothers are simply too lazy, despite the fact that they accuse their own brother of being lazy, which is proven to not be true at all, as we can see through several examples given in the story. Him asking for the right tools and ingredients to obtain the goods he needs for the king, and him escaping the lair of the troll with his life. But one thing I noticed is that this particular Ash Lad isn't as intelligent as the story seems to portray. The first thing that isn't necessarily the, the smartest thing to do is him carrying that bread trow, even though it has sentimental value and it was the only thing he had left from his parents. It helped him in the future, but the trow is something that could have potentially slowed him down or hindered him in his quest to find employment. The second detail I noticed is the ending in which he simply assumes his brothers acted cruelly to him and tricked the king into sitting on the quest because they thought they were showing some sort of tough love. Which maybe means that his success was from his hard working, his, his work ethic and rigor, rather than him being smart and witty, and him making very little effort to escape the quest. So now I'm going to move on and talk about the trolls in the story. Now one thing that you'll notice in these stories, or sort of pick on, pick up on if you've read enough of them, is that trolls are never portrayed consistently in these stories. And at first I thought this was some sort of mandala effect, or not necessarily a continuity error, but just a, a vague inconsistency. Because you have some trolls that are very small. In the last episode, our troll was portrayed as giant. You got trolls that are human sized, and trolls that can be killed by the sun trolls that can be killed as humans are, and trolls that have vision problems. So very little consistency, other than one story pointing out that not all trolls are the, are the same. Obviously in the story we have two, yeah, yeah, two tropes that we normally see among trolls in troll stories. The first one being trolls are of low intelligence, which was odd to me, the way he acted, not him being dumb so much as him just allowing a human character who are, all, are always seen as enemies to take his treasures, because trolls are often uh, also 
violent and hungry. And I was surprised it took so long for this troll to retaliate and capture Ashlad. It's often common for the troll to capture or coerce the human, and then the human must find a way to outsmart the troll and take his life. In one story, a young man convinces a troll that he can eat as much as he likes if he slices open his, his stomach with his knife, which of course kills him. And in this story we have similar events in which the protagonist has to trick his way out of the lair and convince his captors to kill themselves. Now, as I said earlier, at first I found the story to be sort of bland and formulaic, but for some reason there are certain miniature details that I found interesting, and I realized it reminded me of a Brothers Grimm story called The Golden Bird, in which three brothers set off to capture this legendary golden bird and other golden animals for their father, the king. Now, the golden bird is much more complicated, or as complicated as a fairy tale can be, but it is a very, very similar setup, and I can't help but wonder if these two stories all originated from one common story in Europe, or somewhere else. Which isn't to say the story is a ripoff, but it's very eerily sim similar. Alright, so those were my thoughts on Ashlad who stole the king's silver ducks, coverlet, and golden harp. It's not my favorite story in Aspiornson and Mo, and for the most part, it's a pretty standard uh, Ashlad or Boots tale. And even a standard sort of fairy tale in general. But it still retains that charm that I love about these stories. And even a few decent morals. As always, if you have any thoughts, personal thoughts about the story, or any questions, or compliments, or some constructi constructive criticism, feel free to email me at powered by blue fuel at gmail.com uh, shoot me a message on Instagram or Facebook blue belt podcast leave a comment there as well like my pages I'm, I'm very new to podcasting so any feedback really is good right now so this is episode 2 and I hope you enjoyed it till next time